The title of our sermon tonight is Weak Like Any Other Man. Weak Like Any Other Man. Our text, Judges chapter 16, verses 1 through 22. And tonight now, as we return to the history of Israel during the period of the Judges, we find ourselves once more embroiled in the circumstances that surround the life of Samson. As foretold by the angel of the Lord, uh, consecrated as a Nazarite before he was born, even from the womb, Samson would be the miraculous child of a barren woman destined to deliver, to deliver God's people from the grip of their Philistine oppressors. And what began as an account, as a story of uh, great hope, uh, what should have been a cause for great joy, has turned out with our main character being somewhat of a walking contradiction, <laughs> being a bit of a paradox. Um, he is, on the one hand, uh, the agent of providential divine fulfillment, right? Samson called by God to deliver his people. And on the other hand, Samson appears to be the embodiment of fallen human disappointment and human depravity. He is a man of extraordinary strength and at the same time a man of very ordinary weakness. And we see both of those qualities exhibited in Samson. At one moment, he's the walking expression of divine power. And the next moment, he seems to be a sinful expression of human depravity. He's a walking contradiction, a bit of a human paradox here. Uh, often strength being displayed, and yet we see him as weak like any other man. Well, this evening in chapter 16, we bear witness together of the downfall of Samson the judge. The seeds of this downfall have been sown all along the way, all along the account that we've been given here. And we see that in the character and in the actions of Samson. Samson has a problem with lust. And it will play a significant part in Samson's undoing. He takes a wife from among the Philistines for no other reason than Samson likes the way she looks. Right? She appealed to him. She looked good in his eyes. Tonight in chapter 16, Samson is found in the bed of a harlot. Then he is found in the arms of the devious and deviant Delilah. We'll see that as we work through our text. To this problem with lust, we could add other physical passions that Samson appears to be driven by. We've seen that as we worked through these chapters. Samson is angry, and he seems to be driven by anger. Samson driven by his passions, motivated by emotion. He has a bloodlust for vengeance, as we've seen. And beyond that, Samson has shown little to no observable commitment to the Lord or to the Lord's cause. Samson seems to be out for himself. He's abandoned his consecration, his separation to the Lord as a Nazarite. He's all but abandoned that commitment. He is self-serving, following what he believes to be his own course. He doesn't attribute his victories to the Lord as other judges have. Apart from crying out to the Lord in thirst, he doesn't cry out to the Lord at all. He doesn't seek the Lord's direction. He doesn't ask for the Lord's help. It doesn't appear to be grateful for the Lord's gracious provision. Instead, Samson gives every evidence that he is prideful, driven by his passions. Samson tends to be self-reliant, self-confident, self-willed, self-absorbed. And the seeds of his downfall have been sown in this self-will. Samson, apart from the Lord, is weak like any other man. And I think that's one of the morals of the story, right? Samson, apart from the Lord, apart from the work of the Spirit of God in him, is weak just like any other man. And he displays many of the weak and fallen attributes of any other fallen man. Doesn't matter how strong you think you are, these character flaws, these sinful tendencies are the seeds of disaster for any man, for any woman. Doesn't matter how strong you may think you are, it's through these that men fall all the time. They've been the downfall. These character flaws have been the downfall of many a professing Christian. Many, many a professing Christian. These flaws have been the downfall of many a deacon. They've been the downfall of many a pastor, the downfall of many a husband, many a wife, many a son, many a daughter. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands 
Take heed lest he fall. Tonight, we witness the downfall of Samson. The downfall of Samson in chapter 16 begins with a fatal compromise in verse 1. Look at verse 1 with me. Samson went to Gaza and saw a harlot there, and Samson goes into her. As in chapter 14, Samson shows himself to be dominated by his lusts. Gaza is in the far south of the country. It's along the border of the Mediterranean Sea in the south of Israel, so it's a good ways away. But you don't have to go too far today to wind up in the bed of a harlot, do you? It's just a click or two away. Right, a click or two away and you're in adultery. A click or two away and you're in the bed of a harlot. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 26. For by means of a harlot, a man is reduced to a crust of bread. I believe there that uh, what Solomon uh, intended is that it, a man who's given over to harlots will find himself in poverty. But I also think a crust of bread is a really good way of describing his constitution. <laughs> A man who is continuously given over to his lusts, continuously in the wicked bonds of sexual immorality, will find him weakened as a crust of bread. His constitution dried up. Do you see? He's not strong. He's weak. He's weak. By means of a harlot, a man is reduced to a crust of bread, and an adulteress will prey upon his precious life. Can a man take fire to his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be seared? You hear what the proverb is saying, right? Verse 32, whoever commits adultery with a woman lacks understanding. He who does so destroys his own soul. Wounds and dishonor he will get and his reproach will not be wiped away. Well, Samson doesn't go far from her house. Samson winds up in her bed. How many times have we seen men we would have presumed to have been strong. You would have thought would have been strong. How many times have we seen men torn down, reduced to a crust of bread over sexual immorality? How many times? How many times do we have to be reminded of that lesson before we will repent of our sexual immorality and turn? Brothers, Proverbs chapter 5, verse 8, remove your way far from her. Fear that place near her like the plague and avoid it. Do not go near the doors of her house lest you give your honor to others and your years to the cruel one. Why do you remove your way far from her? What's the reason for that? It's because that sin, that sin has tentacles. That sin has a far-reaching power. It has an influence. So I was once talking to a brother a while back. I'm just reminded of this, that uh, he had repented of former drug use. Years ago, had been involved in drugs and repented of that, turned. The Lord gave him deliverance from that, praise God, right? Repented of his drug use and came to Christ. And he was in the house one day of a stranger in there, had been invited in and they had a bag of weed in the kitchen sink. And he said that the memory of all that came sort of flooding in upon him and he felt the physical effects of the remembrance of that sin that he'd once been involved in. It had, a, it had a power. That sin has tentacles, do you see? You may think that you're strong, but you get too close to that and it has a power over you. It can lead you into temptation, lead you into lust, lead you into sin. Sin, when it's fully conceived, brings forth death. Remove your way far from her. You've got to cut off every one of those tentacles. Don't entertain any semblance of habitation with that wicked sin. Do you see? Matthew Henry. Those that would, keep, would be kept from harm must keep out of harm's way. Such tinder there is in the corrupt nature that it is madness upon any pretense whatsoever to come near the sparks. You've got to cut off the hand that offends, pluck out the eye that offends, uh, make your way far from her. You put yourself, think with me, you put yourself near to temptation, and yet you pray, Lord, deliver me from temptation, right? Lead us not into temptation, Lord, and then you put yourself near to temptation. Lead us not into temptation, Lord, and then you allow for 
tempting influences in your life. Cut them off. Go to every, put every effort into it. Make every diligent effort to cut off temptation. Whatever a man reaps, that will he sow. Putting yourself near to temptation or allowing temptation to be near you while praying, Lord, lead me not into temptation is mocking God. Do you see? It's mocking God. Trust the Lord. Otherwise, you are weak like any other man. Trust the Lord. Fight. Depend upon the Holy Spirit and trust the Lord. Well, in verse 2, when the Gazites were told, Samson has come here, they surround the place and they lay in wait for him all night at the gate of the city. You know, the spiritual illustration of this or counterpart, the analogy might be uh, Satan prowling around like a lion, seeking whom he may devour, uh, waiting for you to slip into the room with that harlot. The Gazites were told, Samson has come here. They surround the place. They lay in wait for him all night at the gate of the city. They were quiet all night, saying, in the morning when it is daylight, we will kill him. The gates of the city were very often at the end of a a tunnel-like opening in the city wall. Uh, City walls were often thick, and there was a bit of a tunnel made because of guard housing on either side of the entranceway to the city. Gates at one end, guard houses on either side. It made like a tunnel, a tunnel-like passage. It's likely that they would have slept in the guards' quarters there on either side of the entranceway to the city until morning. Either way, it was, Samson was able to get to the gates and pick the gates up. Look at verse 3. Samson lay low till midnight, and he rose at midnight. They would have been sound asleep, maybe even a drunken slumber. He took hold of the doors of the gates of the city, the two gate posts. He pulled them up, bar and all, put them on his shoulders, and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. Now, gate houses to a city like this often were known to be two to three stories high. These gates would have been absolutely massive, made of iron, a mixture of iron, thick wood. They were made to be defensive structures, weren't easily to break into. So they would have been very thick, very strong, and very, very heavy. I remember one time we were at the British Museum, and uh, I believe it was the, the gates of the city of Nineveh. They actually had these gates uh, in the British Museum from that time period, which is absolutely amazing. But these gates were massive, massive, huge wooden iron structures. So to think that Samson literally walked over to those gates and heaved them up upon his shoulders. And then Hebron, if you think about the location of Hebron, Hebron was 40 miles to the east, northeast, in the heart of Judah. So this was a long way that Samson walked with these gates before, the, before he dropped them off. And essentially, Samson was making a point to his own people, I'm not going to be bested by the Philistines. Right? He drops these huge gates off at the hill that faces Hebron. But notice in the text, no mention of the Spirit of God rushing upon him. Now, obviously, Samson did this in the power of the Spirit. Uh, there's not a man strong enough to do this on his own apart from the power of the Spirit of God. We've seen the Spirit of God rush upon Samson before. He killed a thousand Philistines with a jawbone of a donkey. Right? We've seen the Spirit rush upon Samson here. Obviously, in the power of the Spirit, Samson lifts the gates, but no mention in the text of the Spirit of God coming upon him. Uh, this is a looming, foreboding, ominous thought that trouble is soon on the way. Spirit of God not mentioned as before. Samson has a problem. The effects of that problem are going to become clear here very soon. Well, apart from genuine repentance, one tragic compromise leads to another, which leads to another, which leads to another, which leads to full-out apostasy and downfall. And we see one more compromise leading to another with Samson beginning in verse 4. Afterward, after having gone into the harlot in Gaza, Afterward, it happened that he loved a woman in the, woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. He should have stayed in Hebron, but he didn't stay in Hebron. Hebron in the heart of Judah, he goes back out west toward Philistine country, and he finds another harlot, Delilah. Delilah here is the first woman mentioned by name in the Samson accounts. You notice that? That's interesting. It's likely the name is a Hebrew pun. When you break it apart in the Hebrew, it means of the night. So Delilah was of the night. It's Samson's plunge into sin with this woman of the night that will plunge Samson himself into darkness. 
literally plunge Samson into darkness when the Philistines scoop out his eyes. But spiritually, it plunges Samson into darkness when the Lord departs from him in verse 20. So trouble's coming. Well, the plot for Samson's downfall then is now cast. Verse 5, the lords of the Philistines, the governors, came up to Delilah and said to her, entice him. Find out where his great strength lies and by what means we may overpower him so that we may bind him to afflict him. And every one of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. Now the plan of the Philistines here made clear through the use of four verbs in verse 5. Look at those verbs in verse 5. That we may discover, that we may overpower, that we may bind, and then we may torture. This is the plan of the Philistines. There were five predominant cities of the Philistines, meaning that there would have been five Philistine lords or governors. So Delilah's take for her trouble would have been 5,500 pieces of silver. Now that is an absurd amount of money. It's a large sum, more than the 400 shekels of silver that Abraham paid for the land in Hebron to bury his wife in Genesis chapter 24. It's more than the 50 shekels of silver that David paid for Araunah's oxen in 2 Samuel chapter 24. It's more than the 30 shekels that was the price of a slave in Exodus chapter 21. It's more than the 30 shekels that Judas was paid for betraying the Lord Jesus Christ. It's more than three times the weight of gold that Gideon got for besting the Midianite kings in Judges chapter 8. And we saw in Judges chapter 8 how Gideon lived like a king off that money that he'd made in Judges chapter 8. So Delilah said to Samson, verse 6, motivated by the money, right? Please tell me where your great strength lies and with what you may be bound to afflict you. Now, it seems to us like... Um, Wow, there's a motive to that question, <laughs> doesn't it? Tell me with what you may be bound so that you may be afflicted. Well, honey, why would you ask? Why would that come to mind? <laughs> so Samson said to her, I think at this point, right, Samson is, Samson's prideful. We've already seen that. He is confident, very self-confident, self-reliant. And so Samson, even from the beginning of the account, really seems to be playing games here. Right, even from posing the riddle with those men of uh, the Philistines, and then uh, you know, he's just building up self confidence, self reliance here. And so I think he's willing to play along. Samson said to her, If they bind me with seven fresh bowstrings, not yet dried, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. <laughs> well, these would have been seven fresh sinews. What does that mean? They would have been tendons from a newly or freshly slaughtered animal. Now think with me. They're not yet dried. Not unlike the fresh jawbone of the donkey that Samson picked up to kill the Philistines in the last chapter. What does that tell us once again? Once, now Samson is specifying, specifying that these are to be fresh hamstrings, or, you know, fresh tendons. Samson is once again ignoring his original vow. Ignoring his consecration as a Nazarite. They were forbidden to have come in contact with any part of a dead anything. And yet here Samson is specifically mentioning fresh bowstrings. It's beginning to sound like Samson may actually be showing contempt for his consecration, doesn't it? Like he may be actually despising his separation to the Lord. We'll find out as we go. Verse 8. So the lords of the Philistines, they brought up to her seven fresh bowstrings, not yet dried, and she bound him with them. Now men were lying in wait, staying with her in the room. And she said to him, Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he broke the bowstrings as a strand of yarn breaks when it touches fire. So the secret of his strength was not known. First attempt ends in failure. All right? Let's see what happens with the second attempt. Verse 10. Delilah said to Samson, look, you've mocked me, Samson. You've told me lies. Now, please tell me what you may be bound with. You know, again, Samson playing along with the game because she was obviously seen with the first attempt 
to be devious and manipulative and uh, wanting to bind Samson, delivering Samson over into the hands of the Philistines, and yet Samson continues to play along. He said to her, yeah, this may be in Samson's mind, just a way to kill more Philistines. Verse 11, he said to her, if they bind me securely with new ropes that have never been used, then I shall be weak and be like any other man. Therefore, Delilah took new ropes and bound him with them and said to him, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. Men were lying in wait, staying in the room, but he broke them off his arms like a thread. So the second attempt ends in failure. You'd think that Samson, maybe even Delilah, would tire of this game. Delilah's got 5,500 shekels of silver on the line. She's not going to tire that easily. Samson continues to play along. Verse 13, Delilah said to Samson again, until, you, until now you've mocked me, you've told me lies. Tell me what you may be bound with. And he said to her, if you weave the seven locks of my head into the web of the loom, and so she wove it tightly with the batten of the loom and said to him, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he awoke from his sleep, pulled out the batten and the web from the loom. The third attempt ends in failure. Now you have to begin to think, well, all right, now the Philistines are stupid also. <laughs> They're just playing into Samson's hands as well. Samson is playing a dangerous game, and Samson is getting obviously and very ominously close to the mystery that surrounds his great strength. He has started uh, mentioning his hair now, right, with the loom. So what does Delilah do then? She begins to get a little more desperate, and so Delilah resorts to the same age-old strategy employed by Samson's Timnite wife that we saw earlier. She said to him, verse 15, How can you say, I love you, Samson, when your heart is not with me? You've mocked me these three times and have not told me where your great strength lies. And it came to pass when she pestered him daily with her words and pressed him so that his soul was vexed to death. Now notice the Hebrew verbs again in verse 16. Delilah oppressed him. Delilah <clears throat> excuse me, Delilah persistently annoyed him, that's what the, the word means, and Delilah vexed him to the point of death. Delilah is relentless, is she not? And so Samson, exasperated, he's just come to the end of his patience with all of this, finally pours out his heart to her. Verse 17, he told her all his heart and said to her, no razor has ever come upon my head, for I've been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaven, then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. Shocking, isn't it? Shocking. Samson, think with me, Samson has been fully aware of his vow all along. Think with me about the accounts in chapter 14. And then in chapter 15, and now in chapter 16. And each time, Samson just neglects his Nazarite vow. And at first blush through the text, we might think to ourselves, well, maybe he's not aware of that. Or maybe he doesn't understand what he's supposed to be doing. Maybe he doesn't know the law. No. It all of a sudden becomes very obvious that Samson is fully aware of his vow, his consecration to God as a Nazarite all along. He knows that he's not to shave his head. He knows the rules, the regulations surrounding the Nazarite covenant that he's made. He's certainly and fully aware of the high calling with which he's been called by God. Samson is aware of these things. So his neglect then really doesn't look like neglect anymore, does it? Looks more and more like contempt. Looks more and more like obvious avoidance. He, you could say, despises that birthright. He treats it as a common thing. He seems to be going out of his way now to violate his consecration, to despise that he has been separated to God. Maybe he's uh, now grown because he you know, doesn't feel as though he can do his own thing. He's so self-willed, self-reliant. He wants to live life for himself, and this consecration to God is a hindrance to him it's burdensome to him, and so he intentionally, purposefully despises it by, of, by faulting himself in it, by 
transgressing the covenant that he's made. Looks like he's despising his birthright. Maybe Samson thought that he could trust Delilah here. Verse 17, I really believe that it was likely pride that causes Samson Samson to finally give in. Samson's exasperated, but Samson all along has really thought that he wouldn't face any consequences for his actions. He says in verse 20, I'll go out as before at other times and shake myself free. Right, his hair's been cut. But Samson in his pride thinks that he's going to go out just as, as he al- just as he always has. Right, no consequence is going to fall upon me. And there's this subtle and insidiously deceptive thought that always creeps into the mind of a brazen or high-handed sinner. And it's exemplified here in the, the account of Samson. The brazen or high-handed sinner begins to think to himself, I will go on as I have before. I will go out as at other times and shake myself free, and they continue to sin. And I'll go out as other times before, and they continue to sin. God is forgiving. No consequence is going to come upon me, and they continue in their sin. I'm a Christian. I prayed the prayer, or I walked an aisle, or I did this thing or that thing, or I was sincere. I mean it. Listen, I believe in Jesus. No harm will come upon me. I'm not going to face the consequences of my sin. I'll go out as before, as at other times, and shake myself free. No terrible consequences will befall me. I'm a Christian. Listen, that is a lie that you tell yourself. The Bible gives very strong warnings to those who persist in unrepentant sin. Turn from your sin or be sure your sin will find you out. There are many, many, many who will say to him in that day, Lord, Lord, who will not enter the kingdom of heaven, but those who what? Who do the will of my Father in heaven. Look, Lord, look what we've done in your name, right? We've preached in your name. We've cast out demons in your name. We've done many works in your name, many wonders in your name. And yet, what does the Lord say? Depart from me. I never knew you, you who practice lawlessness. You make a practice of lawlessness. What you're doing is validating that you are not a Christian. Turn from your sin. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord, by His Spirit, by His Spirit will give you strength such that you're not fighting your sin like any other man, but you're going out in the strength of the Spirit to fight your sin, and you will have victory in Him. But don't just continue to turn in a brazen, high-handed, self-willed, self-reliant, self-absorbed way to your sin and expect that you'll go out as you always have. Everything will be fine, right? There are those scoffers that come. Peter mentions them in 2 Peter chapter 3. Scoffers that come in the last days, mocking and saying, where's the promise of his coming? Things have continued this way from the beginning and they willfully forget that God judged the earth with a flood. And there is a flood of judgment coming for those who do not turn from their sin to trust Christ alone. We cannot play with sin. That is the, one of the morals of this account from Samson. Cannot play with sin. The Spirit of God is the source. The Spirit of God is the cause of the Christian's strength against sin. Quench the Spirit through brazen, heavy-handed, unrepentant sin, and your strength goes. Do you see? Your strength goes. You'll be found weak like any other man. Well, in verse 18, when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, She sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up once more, for he's told me all his heart. So the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money in their hand. Then she lulled Samson to sleep on her knees, and he called for a man, had him shave off the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him, and his strength left him. Well, in asserting the spiritual reality reflected in this physical account, The Lord Jesus Christ says in John 15 that apart from him, we can do nothing. Apart from the work of the Spirit, Samson can do nothing. God is our refuge. God is our strength. It is he who gives strength and power to his people. The psalmist says, my heart, my flesh fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. 
It's his strength that is made perfect in my weakness. <laughs> Therefore, most gladly, Paul says, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Well, this is a lesson that Samson is going to learn in the school of hard knocks. Verse 20. She said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as before at other times and shake myself free. But, this is a tragic statement, but he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. Full of fatal self-confidence, full of fatal self-reliance, Samson says, I'll go out as before at other times. But a tragic deception. He did not know that the Lord had departed from him. Well, in verse 21, the Philistines took him and they put out his eyes. They brought him down to Gaza. They bound him with bronze fetters and he became a grinder in the prison. And what begins in Gaza in a harlot's bed ends in Gaza in a prison cell. However, leaving us with hope, <laughs> the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaven. Now, what's so interesting about Samson is that here in this account, Samson is not only Samson. <laughs> Samson is also Israel. Think with me. Consider, Samson is to be consecrated or separated to God unlike other men. Right? He's separated to God to be unlike other men. He's a Nazarite, separated to God, and yet he despises his separation, despises his consecration. And he insists on acting like any other man. His conduct proves that to the point where he is so distant from God that he is weak like any other man. Now think about the comparison with me. Israel. Israel is to be separated to God from other nations. And yet Israel acts just like other nations, despising her consecration, despising her separation to God. And she is weak. Here she's powerless against the Philistines. She's spiritually blinded by her sin. Think with me, Samson is blinded and taken away to Gaza. Zedekiah, Israel's last king, is blinded bound in bronze fetters and taken off to Babylon. Samson becomes a picture of Israel. Samson lusts after foreign women, marrying pagans, bedding harlots. Israel does the same thing in her harlotry, in her idolatry, and God accuses her of such, right? Says so. She plays the harlot with foreign gods and forsakes her husband. Samson suffers for his waywardness. Does Israel suffer for her waywardness? Yes. Israel is sent into exile, first into Assyria, the northern kingdom, and then Judah, the southern kingdom, into Babylon. Only when he needs something, water, for example, something to drink, does Samson cry out to the Lord for help? Israel, only when she is misery, in misery does she cry out for deliverance. And it's entirely self-serving when she does that. It's amazing, the parallels, right? This story is in, his, in Israel's history to point Israel to their own failures, their own weaknesses. This account, it's a historical account by the God who authors history, but it's a picture of the nation of Israel. But there are parallels also between Samson and Jesus Christ. As a judge, Samson points us beyond his weak and flawed character, this weak and flawed Savior, to the Lord's anointed, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Angel, the angel announces his birth, the angel of the Lord, remember in Judges 14. It's a miraculous conception. His consecration is to God from the womb. His own people at one point reject him, want to, want to turn him over to pagans. He suffered mocking and scorn and derision. He was numbered among the transgressors. Great victory comes through his death, as we'll see next week. These are all hints at one who is perfect, who is the embodiment of divine power. We'll see the Lion of Judah pictured in that next week. God is the author of history. It's amazing how the Lord does that. But Samson also, brothers and sisters, Samson is a picture of many a professing Christian. Many a professing Christian who believe themselves that they are strong, 
when they are tragically weak and they don't know it, don't understand it, won't acknowledge it, they don't realize the danger that they're in, don't realize the dangers that they face. Friends with this world, like Samson marrying a Philistine woman, friends with this world who believe that they are rich have become wealthy, have need of nothing, and yet, as John says, do not know, the Lord says, do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Many run off after their own schemes, giving no consideration to the one who made them, the one who called them with a holy calling. In doing that, they despise their consecration, right? their profession of faith, despise that they have been separated to God. They'd rather run in the course of this world. They have abandoned their vow, as Samson did. It's become burdensome to them. Right? That's why John says that um, holiness, obedience to the Lord, is not burdensome. Obedience to his commands isn't burdensome to the Christian, but to the professing Christian that wearies of their consecration of the Lord, it is burdensome. And someone comes along and says, you know, that's not honoring the Lord, what you're doing or how you're living. And they get defensive and hostile because they despise that consecration, (laughs) would rather not have it so. They don't attribute victories to the Lord, Frankly, victories are fleeting and often none to be spoken of. They cry out to the Lord only in their need. When they become miserable enough in their circumstances to, in desperation, call out to him. They don't seek the Lord's direction. They don't ask for the Lord's help. They don't appear to be grateful for the Lord's gracious provision of a Savior in the Lord Jesus Christ, whose love for us should compel our gratitude and our obedience and our faithfulness and our love and our devotion and our worship. They are often prideful, driven by their passions, self-reliant, self-confident, self-willed, self-absorbed. Notice the comparison. The seeds of their downfall have been sown. And apart from the Lord, they are weak like any other man. They believe themselves in Christ to be strong. But where's the evidence of that, right? If you find yourself in that condition, turn to the Lord in faith. Turn to the Lord in faith. He is our strength. He is our refuge. He is our hope. He is our joy. For some of those who are genuine sons, it's the grace of God to discipline them as sons. That's Hebrews chapter 12. And hardship comes. They learn those lessons in the school of hard knocks. I've had to learn many lessons in the school of hard knocks. You've been walking with the Lord for a little while. You've learned lessons in the school of hard knocks. You know exactly what I'm talking about. And it's in that school of hard knocks that we often realize ourselves to be weak like any other man, right? Lord knows I am weak and I need him. It's oftentimes that we forget that reality and we start walking around in our perceived strength and we forget that we are in great need, in desperate need of the Lord's help, in desperate need of his strength. And the Lord reminds us, graciously for our good reminds us through adversity through difficulty through trial through suffering that we are weak like any other man and we need him it's in that weakness paul says that god shows himself to be strong and he is our strength and lord i'd rather boast in my infirmities then the power of christ may rest upon me boast in your infirmities and rest in the lord we must trust in christ who is our strength the one who has become for us Wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Amen? All glory be to him and him alone. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we praise you, our strength, our refuge, our help in time of need, our Savior, our Deliverer, our great living almighty God. We thank you, Lord, for the salvation that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ and the power that you've given us by your spirit to live for you and to steer clear of sin. I pray, Lord, in the strength of the spirit, we would do that, that we would rely upon you, our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and that we would turn from sin in the strength that the spirit supplies according to your word and live for you fervently, devotedly, earnestly, in love, in praise and gratitude and thankfulness. And I pray, Lord, that you would encourage us, encourage your people with strength from your spirit 
genuine strength, true strength, spiritual strength to turn from our sin and to live lives devoted to you. Heart, soul, mind, and strength, Lord, we want to love you and want to praise you and worship you as we should. We want to live lives that are pleasing to you, worthy of the calling with which we've been called. Help us to do that, Lord. We are weak like any other man in our own strength. Uh, where we are weak, you are strong, and we praise you and thank you for it. Thank you for these promises. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.